intervention, why? Because we need to change things. No, early intervention, why? Early intervention, because we are creating support for these kids to flourish. Hello, my name is Sebastian, and I invite you to this podcast episode from Enable Ireland. And really think of your everyday life. Today, and in our first episode, I talked to Sylvia Segales, an early intervention specialist, creator of the Circle program, event speaker and love tutor. Mediated interventions are actually more effective than professional implemented interventions. Mm. So that so. idea of I hire and I fire, for me, is like, he's hired. He doesn't know, but he's hired. <laughs> not hired. Not We're hired. not only and Sylvia is a mother of two and has a son with autism. In this conversation, she shares her experiences and thoughts on being both a clinician as well as a parent of a young person with a disability. You, know how to respond to a problem. you can listen to an extended version of this conversation in our full podcast episode, link below in the description. I'm grateful for having had the opportunity to speak to Sylvia and I hope this conversation is as interesting to you as it was for me. My aim is to speak with people who share stories about work and life with and around disability, who share stories that are interesting, illuminating, inspiring and bring out the ability part within the word disability. Stories that are rich with thoughts and ideas for reflection. I want to enable conversations. Thank you once again for making the time to to talk and I'm, you. you know and I'm, I'm curious how the conversation will evolve um yeah tell me tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do as a person yeah. and who you are so so uh my name is sylvia angel and i am an early intervention uh, specialist I have been working in early intervention, supporting families and children with developmental delays for the last 20 years. As you can hear from my accent, I'm originally from Barcelona, but I've been in Ireland, you know, since I, in my early 20s. And, and I have two children and my eldest son, Sebi, he is autistic. So I suppose I have, a, a, you know, I see um, early intervention or special education from both sides of the fence, from being a professional and supporting families, but also uh, parenting a child with the special needs mm. and, 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 and having experience of services as a, a service user. That's one of the uh, big reasons why I wanted to talk to you is the, uh, mm. because you have this uh, unique, um, I think, unique view of someone who works as a, as a professional as a clinician but also has a but is also a mother a parent of a child with um, special needs would you agree that that gives you a unique perspective I, I would and, and I'll tell you why because I suppose I worked in early intervention for 10 years before I became a mom and before my son mm. was diagnosed so I suppose once I became a parent of a child with a special needs even a lot of things changed for me and I started reflecting on my practice and looking at things in a very different way. Before I had my son, I understood from a cognitive point of view what families were going, were going through, but mm. then I could understand it more from an emotional point of view. Yeah. So I could understand them better. And I also understood early intervention in a very different way. I wanted to work with him and I wanted to, okay, let's sit down and let's do this, all these activities that I'm doing with all the children that I'm working with but obviously my son was like you know you are mommy he just wanted to play with me I mean like there was no way he was sitting down and doing all those things so and that was very frustrated frustrating for me so I had to find other ways to help him but actually I've discovered that actually uh, that, that there was other ways which is more mm. implementing early intervention strategies throughout I'm the day in the end that has been a lot were more you, helpful to him. Were, do you have an example of something? Do you remember a situation where yeah, you had, so, maybe it was a situation where you had, there was like a, a real a wake up moment for you, or, or I don't know. Yeah, because so, so 
I organized his playroom and I got lots of yeah. toys and it's like, okay, we're going to do all these activities. I prepared little visual schedules for him and it's like, okay, let's sit down, Sebi. And, let's and when you say thing. activities, uh, sorry, sorry, but you know, I said to you yeah. before, interrupting someone is a sign of uh, listening um, <laughs> actively. So those activities you just said you were doing, they were also kind of therapeutic activities. Yes, is, is that it's Would like, you let's call say, tabletop that? activities, like uh, looking at pictures, matching pictures, do pegboards, do puzzles, the, all those kind of activities. And he was having none of that. Like, he didn't want to do it. His engagement, like, I suppose he preferred to play by himself mm. and not engaging with me as much. And that was very frustrating for me. At that point, it helped me understand one thing. Um, very often when I worked with families, I would work with the kids and then give families a home program. And it was like a five pages long. Mm. It was a very dedicated professional. So these are all the activities the, that you could do with your child. The longer the better. I was always wondering, yeah. why are parents not, most parents, 90% of families were not actually following up on those home, very long home programs. And then I understood why, because it's not that easy. When you have a young child with a special needs, day-to-day -day life can be quite difficult. And, and, and daily things like, you know, going to the shops, come back home and cook lunch, it can be very difficult when you have a child who may not follow instructions, who may not uh, do well transitioning from the playroom mm. to the car, from the car to the shop. Like life, everyday life was quite challenging. So then I couldn't actually do all those things that in my head I had to do. Over time, I realized, for example, in our case, bedtime was a time that for whatever reason, and it still is, by the way, mm -hmm. Sebi is very responsive. For whatever reason it is, the minute, you know, he's got his pajamas, brushes his teeth, has his shower, whatever, goes up to the bedroom, and it's a time that he's really communicative, he's very affectionate, he wants to engage with me, have conversations, he loves reading, and mm -hmm. that happened as well when he was little, so then I realized, here I have a window of opportunity, mm -hmm. I'm gonna use those bedtime routines and then bedtime routine instead of 20 minutes, it was like a two hours long and it still is like a really long, and but it's the best moment of the day. Sometimes as a parents, we may feel guilty that we're not doing enough for our children. And I think that happens to all parents, but you know, think of mm -hmm. parents of children with the special needs, that guilt can, feeling of guilt can be overwhelming. I'm not doing enough. I'm not helping my child enough. I'm not doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And just by finding those windows of opportunities during the day, I can relax a little bit more because I know that I'm going to yeah. have that opportunity and where I'm going to take it. That feeling of guilt, where do you mm -hmm. think that comes from? And, and I'm going to add to that question, actually, do you think that we... Uh, when I say we, I mean the clinician, so I'm a clinician as well, mm. that we sometimes add to that, uh, maybe without realizing or without and wanting actually, to. Actually, yeah, and it, it, it's, it's a great question because actually I, I actually never thought of it. Well, as you're asking this question, I'm thinking probably we do. When I was giving parents that those home programs five pages, mm you're going to add to that guilt nothing against home programs i would have given people a, almost a to-do list they couldn't implement it so i imagine they probably felt very guilty like i felt guilty with sebastian not being able to do those to-do lists that i was giving to people then it's like mm. oh, but i can't do that and then mm. that feeling of guilt i'm not doing enough or yeah i'm not doing enough there, there the are so consequences many consequences that can have for your child uh, or, or the guilt can come from what you think. Uh, but again, it's about finding other strategies that might work better. Mm. Uh, something that happened recently, I met a new family and uh, I was very eager to meet them. I read all the information about the child. I planned the visit and then <clears throat> they came into the clinic and the child came into the room and literally in two minutes, the whole room was upside down. Every single box was emptied. Uh, he threw all the toys on the shelf on the floor. He was climbing on the chair, climbing on the table. And I, and then, then the mom was uh, so apologetic, which she didn't need to. Um, and I believe that's how the child functions at home. Yeah. So in I, that case, I, my I, advice I, is going to be very different. And then we're going to start with something very small and something realistic. And I demonstrated and I mm. explained I'm doing this because of that. 
and that's how you can do it at home. And we're going to start with a very small step. So it's very much about getting to know the families that you're working with, getting to know the kids, being family-centered, and being family-centered, it means get to know them first and then provide advice that you think um, that, that they can implement. I, I, I want to add that I suppose my yeah. experience with my son, Sebastian, and with all his other autistic friends, it has given me a lot of, I wouldn't say confidence, but I'm comfortable. Like mm. in that case, in that visit, initially we both panicked. And I have to say, I had prepared the visit very carefully and I laid out all the toys I wanted mm. the child to play with. So like in two minutes as well, my plan was all like this mantle, this is not going to happen. And I panicked as well initially. And then I just remind myself, sit back, observe, let's think. So I'm more comfortable with being uncomfortable because mm. of my experience with my son, because of my experience with all his friends. I'm comfortable with that. And you know what? I think that has an effect on the child because the child can sense that, you know, if mm. you, you know, get anxious, yeah. stressed, worried, what am I going to do now? Because professionally, for a professional as well, like some circumstances, it can be That's... like, how am I going to engage with this child? I need to identify how can I support the child and what needs to be done first. Mm. I need to identify that. I need to be able, in that case, for example, so in that, in that case, so this, immediately I thought there's two things. The child was a little bit overwhelmed. I need to help this child calm, da calm down. And then here, I'm going to use intensive interaction and some of the Hannon principles. Mm. So I decided that. And I'm going to start that small. That's the first step. See that little window up, see, those, see that the child took that activity, started and finished that, even if it was like for 30 seconds, that's great. That's our starting point. That's what we're going to do. And I was modeling. And, and I think um, when that mother left the room, I think she was feeling a lot more positive. I'm still very curious about the whole uh, topic uh, around discomfort or experiencing discomfort mm. and being at ease with that. What, what are, um, are you happy to share a, a uncomfortable situation you were in as a parent with uh, Sebi mm. that, and maybe, wow. maybe that's, maybe that's something, maybe a situation that's mm. changed your view in which you experience, oh, okay, so that's what it's like, uh, you know, that this is what maybe some of the parents I work with experience. Mm, I, I, I'm going to share something that it's a little bit uncomfortable for me to share, but, but I think that it can be, give really good insights. We're not only talking about being comfortable with com discomfort, we're also practicing being comfortable with discomfort ah, here. Yes, so. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so work away. So Sebastian would have been maybe three or four years of age. He was very young. I was still processing and trying to figure out what it meant you know, that the fact that he had autism, I was trying to process all this. Um, so there was a lot of emotions for me. And then something happened and I got very angry with the services, very angry to a point that I actually am not somebody who, you know, I became kind of very uh, aggressive verbally. I was overwhelmed by emotions. Mm -hmm. When there's a lack of services or some services might be Taken, taken away from you or something that you mm. expected doesn't happen. What happens, especially in the early years, the services that your child is receiving, that is your hope. Mm. That is your hope. You're hanging on to that. If that happens, my child is going to do well. If that doesn't happen, my child is not going to do well. It's not necessarily truth, but that's how are you experiencing that in mm. that moment. What happens is like your hopes are taken away and that hurts. And there can be a lot of emotions and there can be a reaction and it can be very difficult and very uncomfortable for the parent who's complaining, who's on the phone, who's crying, who's upset. And for the professional who's in the receiving end, that most of the time that professional, it, there's something that they, it's not under mm. their control and they can't do anything about it. It's uncomfortable for both. And what happens after that? It's mm. the fact that we are not used to being uncomfortable. What happens after that? I felt shame how I reacted. You know, I did that. I lost control. Okay. I'm not usually like that. They see me as aggressive. Well, actually, I'm not. And I'm mm. uncomfortable with that. And I know that they are uncomfortable with mm. me too. They're going to see me again, but I know that they are uncomfortable too. Now I know what did I need at that point. And that's something that I've reflected. I was, I was just going to ask you, yeah, what, 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 
was it that would have helped you? And maybe yeah. maybe that's even something you are aware of now when you work with yeah. parents that you can yeah. see are experiencing the same arc of emotions. As a professional, knowing that the parent is hurting, it has nothing to do with you. The parent is hurting and you as a professional have the obligation to help. Normally what happens in people would distance uh, a little bit and obviously as a professional then you're more nervous to call that family again or see mm. that family again and I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm going to do it. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we're going to have a difficult conversation again. Most of the time we don't because the parents are hurting and they welcome somebody being understanding, somebody being warm. Maybe there's nothing I can do to solve that particular issue, but I'm going to, normally I find an excuse to ring them again, to see them mm. again. It can be about something completely different. I can't help you with this, but I well, want you to know, I don't say it with words, but I want them to know that I'm there for them. I can't yeah. help with this. Maybe there's something else that I can I suppose. do. But it's that process of us knowing it's, it's, that anger was not addressed to us and as a professional we need to heal something there mm. um, so not to move away get closer thank you very much for sharing that uh, it's really interesting to listen to you mentioned something to me before that mm. um, that I want to go back revisit because I thought it was such an interesting story please retell it in your own words if you feel but from what I remember it was uh, about an experience you had where um, you had seen a parent i think with a sign and maybe it was at a protest or mm, something yes and and that the sign had said uh, i am not a therapist i'm a parent or i'm a parent i'm not a therapist the interesting part was how uh, it, you said that it was a kind of a moment for you where you felt yeah. Yeah. i i don't ever want to feel disempowered yeah. like that i'm not sure if that's the word you used but yeah. uh, i think that's what came across from your story is that i don't ever want to feel like there that like i can't help my child that's actually something that happened many years ago when sebastian when my son was was little um right. i was watching the news there was a, a protest parents okay. of children with disabilities asking for better services and rightly so okay um they they were interviewing parents and 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 it just it there was one parent that I, she got my, um, I just looked at her and she was holding a sign that said, I'm a parent, I'm not a therapist. And mm. that it just like struck me. And I know that she was asking for better services for, for her, for her mm. child. And again, yeah, and the, I, so. Yeah, and but the story like, is not, absolutely not about that parent. It's actually about what happened in your head, right? The when words, you saw that. Yeah. the words, yeah. those words, those words, it really just like, it hit me. And you know what? Th that I still hear that all the time, still now today, when mm. parents are, are asking for be better services. As parents, we have the, the, the moral obligation to advocate for our children. But it's when I hear that sentence, I'm a parent, I'm not a therapist. And I, and I think actually, what are you saying when you are saying those words? I'm a parent, I'm not a therapist. You can help my child, I don't know how to. You have the tools, I don't have them. You can make a difference, I cannot. And I thought, oh, that's a very disempowering thought. Somebody else can do it and you cannot. I, I, and, and, and I thought, I don't want to feel this way. And I actually, I don't want the families that I'm working with to feel this way either. And always my goal um, is, is how to empower equip some people don't like the word empower empower equipped families with tools so they can help their children my message to families when i speak to families i always talk to them about i put that example you know i'm mm. a parent i'm not a therapist and i often suggest to them um what i think it's a, it's a better way of seeing themselves is become your own CEO. I see myself as a CEO in this house, you know, with my children. I'm the one who's making decisions and I'm the one who is rearing them and supporting their, their growth and their education. I'm inclined to ask that we bring Sebi and your husband, John, I think, yes, and yes, ask them later as well, do they agree with you being the CEO? 
<laughs> I am the CEO. <laughs> Do they Five. agree? I'm not so sure if they <laughs> agree. <laughs> anyway, sorry. In Go this on. house, we all have very different, uh, very strong uh, personalities. So I think like we're all doing our own. We get yeah. a lot and, of And I know you were talking people. about it's more about the concept of be yes. becoming. So yeah. yeah, tell us more about that becoming yes. your own CEO. The, yeah, becoming your own CEO. As a CEO of a company, you are never 100% sure that what you're doing is the right thing, but you're doing your best and you're trying to surround yourself with people. I use the term and you're going to hire and you're going to fire people who are going to support you. What do I mean by that? For example, Sebastian is now moving on to, he finished sixth class and he's going to go to secondary school. So in that process, I have experienced experienced in early intervention, but I have no idea what happens in puberty and, you know, and I'm in a foreign country in terms like I'm not 100% familiar with the educational system in Ireland, especially at, at secondary level. So that there's a lot of uncertainties for me. So in this process, what have I done as a CEO? I've gathered a lot of information and I have also identified who is going to help me in that process? In that process, I rang the CINO, I rang different schools, I spoke to different principals, I spoke to parents, I interacted with my, my service provider as well. Um, and, and in that process, I identified a few people that I know like these people seemed really eager to help me. They had a lot of information. So I, I hired them um, in, in a metaphorical, uh, I suppose, mm -hmm. sense. Um, and then I fire other people, some other people's like, oh, these are not helpful. So as a CEO, it's not that you have to do everything yourself. Sometimes parents are afraid, well, if I see myself at the, as a therapist, I will need to implement all those interventions. Well, that's not right. You know, we have wonderful schools or preschools or specialized classes mm. that can help us um, and professionals that can guide us. But ultimately, you are in control. Ultim ultimately, you are the, the, the CEO and I want to parents to feel empowered, I suppose, when, when mm. you see yourself as a CEO. And it's not that you have to have all the answers and it's not yeah. that you have to do everything, but you are very much. So the, the empowering ingredient there being yeah. taking charge, is it? Would, would, yes. would you say that's, that, that's it? Yes. That taking charge, taking control, isn't that forging partnerships? We talked about partnership earlier, to become partners, to become a team. It's except Absolutely. that you... I think the point you're making, right, is that you are, as the CEO, you you are driving those, you should be driving these partnerships. In, in that process, uh, so we had to, we had a couple of appointments with a, uh, our occupational therapist, and it was totally unrelated to this transition to secondary school. He was doing some assessments with my son, Sebi, and then we started talking about Sebi's transitioning to secondary school, and then... Uh, out of goodwill, he started sharing, info and I did mention, you know, said he's my first child, so I don't have mm. any experience about that, this transition. So anyway, he gave me really good pointers, uh, which I actually, um, you know, followed up on that advice, and it has been extremely helpful. So that idea of I hire and I fire, for me, is like, he's hired. He doesn't know, but he is hired. If I ever have a question, if I ever, I'm going to pick up the phone because I do have a feeling that this person is going to be there for us. If I have a question, yeah. if there's uh, something. In my process of helping my son, Sebi, mm. probably most of the time, what I have done is basically I have implemented the principles of the programs that I just mentioned. That has been my main intervention which are um, low intensity interventions. It means that you're not sitting with the child and you have to do this for 20 mm. minutes a day. It's not like that at all. It's just like you're interacting with your child as you normally do, but you're doing things slightly different. And that is is so, you know, we see the benefits and there's benefits in, in the, from a child developmental point of view, from a behavioral point of view, and, and we actually have better outcomes with those interventions that are implemented with parents than the specific interventions, again, like this, the, the, mm. the, the clinical model that is the clinician and the child. And I want parents to know that. We know, and literature and research is telling that uh, again and again, that parent-mediated interventions are actually more effective than professional implemented interventions. Mm. So I, I, that's my message for parents and parents listening to that. I just want them to know that. Programs like, for example, um, the Hannon program, 
the Parents Plus program for children with autism, the Early Bird program. All these programs are really going to give you the foundation you need to help your child. What do you think are the kind of the things that happen uh, when it's, mm -hmm. I suppose, family led or parent led? Um, yeah. Like, why does that create better outcomes? What's going to make a difference, especially when we're talking about children with developmental delays and children with autism, what is going to make a difference is what happens not at the visits, at the visits, at those appointments, but in between those appointments. Let me give you an example. I was doing law of training, law of sign language, um, and there was a parent there and she told me, oh, you know, I just want to give you a message from a friend of mine, a parent that had done law of training with me six months ago, and that that had made a huge difference in their life, that the child's life, that the child was signing over 100 signs and that had met, made a, 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 a huge difference. The child was able to communicate better behavior, more engaged, the interaction you know, between the parent and the child. Mm -hmm. So that illustrates that. That all outcome wouldn't have happened doing sessions with the child. That outcome only happened because the parents made it happen. Mm. Um, because it's, again, not what happens during the visits, but what happens in between the visits. All that, um, you know, 24-7, I suppose, support that parents can offer. If we can get teachers involved, if you can get preschools involved, then you are creating a whole network of support for that child. What does the research say? Why is that more effective? Because a parent could probably... Uh, uh, or anybody could respond to that. Well, yeah, but if there's a really good, well-trained therapist working with my child, I wouldn't have to do these in-between things mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. the therapist could really effectively do therapy with my child um, and the child would then learn communication strategies or whatever in that way. Even with ABA, you're not talking about uh, visits, like a one hour visits, ABA, you're mm -hmm. talking about three, four hours of intense intervention a day. So very intense intervention by a mm -hmm. trained professional. So when uh, research is comparing groups of children who did ABA or children who did ABA and parents were trained, so, so that intervention continued at home, not so much ABA, but that the parents were, uh, yeah, were trained in autism and different strategies, that the children that received the ABA intervention plus uh, parents were uh, trained and equipped being able to support the child or continue those interventions at home, those children had better outcomes. So no matter how you look at it, when families are involved, we have better outcomes. When you as a parent are equipped and you have tools and you can support your child you know how to respond to a problem you mm. know how to organize your day-to-day -day life so there's better behavior so that your child can function better the level of stress goes down those feelings of guilt i'm not doing enough goes down i'm doing the right thing so it's actually the best for our children but mm. it's actually the best for us as parents too so i really want people to to, to be aware of that and to know that. Would it be right to say uh, that the, the stress levels go down and it is more effective because essentially what it does is it makes you the CEO. Uh, it brings yeah. you agency, it gives you tools so you can be in control. And I'm actually thinking as you're describing it, I suppose that happens in any walk of life, doesn't it? Don't we always feel better when, especially if we're experiencing a situation that we feel out of control about, if we start having some control over it through whatever means, whether that's through networking or acquiring the tools and skills that equip us better, that it, it lowers the stress at low and it raises the, the sense of having some agency and control of it. What I would like to say is for professionals to, to, to know that we have different options. We have those training courses, but we also have um, opportunities to help families in group situations. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. For years in Dublin, I ran uh, within an organization, uh, parent and toddler groups. Mm -hmm. And it was lovely because... Um, there were children of different ages, so there would have been maybe, you know, parents of children with babies with Down syndrome. And in those groups, they were meeting parents of 
children who were three years of age. So those parents were a little bit ahead in their journey. So they were learning from those other parents and they were seeing how the parents were communicating, what the children were doing, and the, the parents of all the children would give them advice. So again, that, pow that uh, empowering happened on, a, on that level, you know, parent to parent support and actually mm -hmm. witnessing, seeing, because somebody can tell you what you're supposed to do, but actually seeing it and seeing that other mom interacting with the child and what is she doing, how is she speaking, how is she communicating and seeing that, that's really helpful. Um, and then you can model that with your child. So group interventions. So really trying to put important. myself into uh, the shoes of someone who maybe doesn't, um, who, who who doesn't feel that that's helpful to their child. I wonder why they would think that, because the way you explain it, it sounds, mm. it sounds wonderful. Oh, okay, so there are different tools and some of them might be group-based and some of them might be other formats. And actually you could say probably it's great that uh, a professional has different tools to offer, but yet it seems that maybe some uh, that's not always the message that's being received mm. or I don't know I, I wonder why that is it could be because we haven't done our job well at coaching if I can identify realistic goals if I, as a professional if I can demonstrate and parents can see oh my goodness you did this and we achieve that, and it can be a very small goal. But if they can really see that and connect, and you as a professional can explain, so it's our job as professionals, maybe you know, we can look at ways of um, ourselves uh, even training more in how you, uh, how you can coach other people in that mm -hmm. process of explaining, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it, this is what I'm trying to achieve. As a professional, you have your toolbox with lots of tools. And in that session, I take one tool and I'm giving it to the parent. For the parent, it might be overwhelming because they don't have all the tools. So therefore, where do I start? But if, I look, if we look at it and, and, and we break it down, so today I'm going to give you this tool. And again, for some families, maybe you need to do that empowering um, process on a one-to-one. -one. That's something that uh, as a professionals we need to reflect on. Sometimes group training can be the best option. Sometimes the one-to-one, -one, or maybe in the early stages, the one-to-one -one mm. can be a really good option where you can actually literally take just a very small tool this is what we're going to do right now. Let's focus on this. And next time, I'm going to give you another one and another one. And over time, the parent metaphorically has, you know, that, that toolbox with them. Mm. Going back to the example of uh, goal setting, um, and maybe that's something mm. hopefully a lot of people can relate to. Did you have a situation as a parent where you were mm. given a very wide question as what are your goals? Yeah, yeah. And I do remember uh, actually um, being with an early intervention specialist. Mm. So, and I was in that process. I need to sit down with Sebastian and do all these yeah. activities. So she did some sessions with him and she said, what are your priorities? Goal setting. What do mm. I want? Is almost to disconnect from everything and really think of your everyday life. What are you really struggling with? Goals that are very wide, they are very vague. And very often, as I'm getting to know families, um, mm. it's like, oh my goodness, so the goal was this, that, that. And then I'm getting to meet the family and it's like, oh, but actually that child is a flight risk. They're running away. Families have to lock windows and doors and, and put a, you know, a really high gate around the house. because, the, And that mm. was not in the IFSP. Why? Because, you know, I was thinking, oh, what do I want? I don't know. I think kids with autism need uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy. Stop. Okay, let's, let's think about the daily life. How are things going? And that will help us identify really what we need to focus on. So not to think what's the best for children with Down syndrome, what's the best for children with autism, but actually to look at your everyday life. How mm. is it going for me? What are we struggling with? What's going well? actually look at your daily life and, and let's start there. Talking about goal setting, you mentioned the IFSP as well. So that's the family service plan. You did say that at some point. Yeah. How do you think that goal setting, the family service plan, which sounds really formal, but 
I don't know, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to think of it as really just another practical tool within, you know, getting to know a family at the most simplest level. How do you think that goal setting, the family service plan and empowerment, and I think you mentioned family-centered practice earlier as well. So I've added four things now, family service plan, goal setting, empowerment, yeah. family-centered practice. Do you see a link there? What, what, what is the link mm. for you? It's going back to building relationships with families, the individual family service plan. Um, it's, it's about that, um, that relationship with families. Ideally, mm. well, and, and we're doing that. We're doing that. I did, the person that knows the family the best is normally involved in that process. And it's as well, maybe I'm thinking that it would be a good idea as well to have some information or even, I don't know, a webinar or a podcast focusing on that and how can we support the families so as well when that comes up for them um, that they can, that they have more guidance in terms of how can I actually identify goals that are going to be uh, really useful for me or for, the, for them as, as families. Mm. It's a big question, isn't it, Sebastian? Like if somebody asks you, what would you want? What, what are the outcomes? Um, you know, it, it's, it's not easy. So we need to be able to guide them properly and probably over time find ways of informing families so that actually those, uh, those uh, planning meetings are really meaningful and useful to families. Sylvia, thank you very much. That, that was a very interesting conversation. Looking back over our conversation, it seems to me um, some really important active ingredients in working together between families and professionals, well, partnerships really, are uh, things like empowerment, acceptance, being comfortable with discomfort, mm, yeah. uh, probably on both, both sides. Goal setting came up, um, but probably within that context, even more the art of goal setting or the art of how you create a conversation around goal setting. Maybe in, instead of empowerment, I should just say becoming your own CEO. That's that's yes. way more catchy. <laughs> I want people to know, parents and professionals to know that parent mediated interventions are the most effective for our children and for ourselves as families. I want to have that on the table as we're having the conversations. I'm very concerned that we are trying to go back to something we used to do in the past and mm. we've moved on from that because research was telling us that parent-mediated interventions have much better outcomes. I want to say parents that you can do it, you can become your own CEO and for professionals to know that that is the ultimate goal. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. Thank you so much. It has been an honor and I really appreciate that you, know, that you invited me today for, for this conversation. Thank you so much.